out. The summertime hey guys, uh, is dry. Uh, we're going to start here with uh, Captain Mark Harrison with the Bad Habit. That's I want to thank you guys all for coming. Think and, about uh, I hope you guys learned a lot. Uh, always a good so, so, so thank you very much, and uh, Captain Mark. Hey guys, how are y'all? Uh, let me introduce myself, kind of get acquainted with everybody. Uh, my name is Captain Mark Harrison. Uh, our business is Bad Habit Sport Fishing. We have a Sneeds Ferry. We've been fishing uh, for the whole coast here in North Carolina from Morgan Inlet to South Border, south of there even, for the last 30 years. Uh, I decided to, I got my cat's license in 2004, decided to uh, do it full time four years ago. So. Uh, about the last 14 years, uh, or sort of 10 years or so, uh, we've been fishing or living one way or the other. Uh, I know most of you in here, uh, we were talking before the, the that everybody got here, and it seemed like most everybody was doing inshore. There was a couple that were kind of mixed, so I'm going to touch on what I know. I'm strictly offshore. Uh, Wayne uh, and Jason will be here shortly, and they are the inshore uh, guys, uh, and they will dial you guys in on that. I think, uh, you know, we were talking to this gentleman back here, they just acquired a 24-foot boat. Uh, kind of unsure of what to, how to rig it, do things, what it's capable of. You know, a lot of times the vessels that we own are more capable than what we are. I mean, they can take a lot more. They're strong. The consideration that you would want to do would be your weather preparation. Make sure that you have your proper safety gear for a vessel that size 24-foot boat. Uh, it's good to fish around somebody if you're going real far, 30, 40, 50 miles, to have somebody with you, but it's not imperative. I did it for many, many, many years, and you can catch a lot of fish. And uh, the good thing about a boat that size is you're not going to run over fish. I had to kind of, when I went to a 30-foot twin-engine boat, performance boat that can go wherever, holds 240 gallons of fuel, you have a tendency of running over fish sometimes, you know. Well, the fish are on the east side of Cape Lookout during the fall for King Michael fishing, so what do we do? We leave the inlet and we go straight there. Uh, even if we pre-fish and we caught fish here, but we know historically they're going to be there. So sometimes we don't kind of fish as thoroughly as we should, you know, and that's, but you back back into that and then you quit doing that after a while. But uh, the big thing I wanted to kind of go over with everybody today, uh, people, you know, techniques are different, uh, different uh, baits that you use, but there's a few things you can do when you're offshore fishing to make sure you don't miss fish. Make sure you're covering the whole water column. Uh, make sure you're brand specific. And when I say, uh, when I say brand specific, you, if you're trying to catch dolphin, there are certain things dolphin like. If you're trying to catch wahoo, there are certain colors, certain uh, styles, certain speeds that they like. Um, blue marlin, sailfish, different billfish, there's ways that they eat. Um, and uh, so what I'll do is maybe start with some of the uh, game like the dolphin fish and that kind of thing and then work my way into some of your your bill fish has uh, anybody done any uh, big game fishing here? Not in 40 years. 40 years? Not in 40. Okay. I did with my dad when I was a teenager. Oh, okay. To the Marlin sort of fish. Yeah, it's good stuff. Isn't it? Probably if you remember a lot of it. But you're only 45 now. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, oh, it, something I always like uh, and, you know, just because you're trolling offshore, let's say you're in the Gulf Stream and it's mid-May and the dolphin bite is really good and everybody's pulling the same stuff, Islander lures and these big lures for a dolphin, and uh, that's fine. That's The bites can be bigger and better out there, so you could use bigger stuff. Uh, I didn't bring anything exactly for that out of the store today, uh, but, you know, the bigger baits are fine offshore. You're going to catch your, your bigger gaffer dolphin and stuff like that. And uh, you'll also catch with some of the bigger baits, you'll catch your billfish, you'll catch your wahoo or tuna. Uh, typically in mid-May, you're gonna the, the bite's gonna be primarily your big dolphin. You're gonna have your sailfish, white marlin, and blue marlin. You will catch your tunas and you will catch your wahoos, but they're gonna be kind of they're not as prolific as they are like the wahoo in the fall. The wahoo in the fall are gonna be, I mean you basically in the fall I don't even pull any mono at all. I just go strictly wire. But um a lot of people will think that you, okay, well, I mean, it's so expensive to uh, gear up for offshore fishing. And there's a good dolphin bite at 45 or 50 miles, and you heard about it. And uh, the way you hear about it is do all your research. I mean, I've got uh, 
reports on my website. Chris does a report. Uh, there's a lot of information out there. Um, so before you go, it would be the first thing to do would be to find out where the fish are. I mean, you don't want to run just blindly to a number because it sounds like a good number. Okay, there's fish been caught here before. Let's go here. Uh, there's a lot of services out there too. On top of the free reports, uh, you don't necessarily have to pay for a lot of you know, a lot of money for these things. Um, does anybody go on Frying Pan Tower at all? Yeah. Frying Pan Tower has a uh, fish here map that you can purchase for twenty-five dollars. Uh, Dave does a good job of analyzing all the data uh, and putting together a report for you from whatever inlet that you're going out of. So let's say that you're leaving out of, you leave out of topsail? Right. Okay, so let's say you're leaving out of here, you put that in there, he sends you back a report the night before. And it may say, okay, he don't just look at like the sea surface temperature, uh, he will look at mixed layer depth, chlorophyll concentrations, uh, and if you ask me what that is, it's basically when you have chlorophyll, you have smaller bait, you have bigger fish eating on that, then the bigger fish come eat on that. It's, it's just a food chain. And... When you have an area that's been good like that for a number of days, and just because it's good for one day, the bait is good, but the fish may have not found that yet. Uh, temperature breaks are great. Uh, it's, you, it's not permeable. I mean, the bait are going to swim on either side of that, and they can't cross it, so they stack up. It's a good place to fish. But do that. Spend the $25. Get that, and you will save yourself a lot of money and fuel. I mean, it just, it's just being more methodical. Um, you're going a long way. You spent money on your gear, on your boat. But you don't have to spend a lot. Uh, and that's kind of what I was going to get into. This right here, this is a little simple $3 little lure head. And uh, most people, if you don't know how to rig a ballyhoo, there's a lot of videos. Uh, and if anybody wants to learn how to rig a ballyhoo, uh, this ain't the, the proper place to do it, but uh, I don't think Chris would appreciate that. Uh, but I would love to help you with that. If you want, just call me sometime or get online and Google it. But uh, you could do a chin weight, put this right over your ballyhoo. You can use a spring uh, or you could use a, a copper wire to tie it on. I normally trim the skirt just a little bit. And then, so basically it's a very simple, cheap, inexpensive lure. And this one right here I do pull and it works. Uh, you may say, well, why are you pulling a dolphin color lure for a dolphin? A dolphin are very cannibalistic. They, if you know, most dolphins live four years, five years max. They can gain 20 pounds per year. So that tells you one thing. All they're doing is swimming and eating. So uh, it really works well. I mean, dolphin color, that's why you see a lot of chartreuse. It works. I mean, it's a good color. Uh, but that's a very inexpensive lure for a dolphin. It works real well. Um, another thing that I like to do uh, that a lot of people don't do, some people do, is if you're out there fishing, you've seen flying fish, you know, you scare them up in there. Well, that's a good, a lot of times, you know, you get concentrated on an area that you're oh, I'm going to go fish this number. And you go right over an area that the bait just scatters. And you see a bird dive and you're, you know, and you, you're dead set, you're going on, you're going to that number. It might be worth investigating that place, and you, you know whether you get a bite there or not. Some of my best fishing spots, I will stop because of that. As I'm trolling or whatever I'm going to be doing around that area, you'll see you'll see the bottom, and you'll wow, look at that ledge. So you mark that ledge, and then you keep trolling around. Wow, look at this man. This is so then you're thinking, wow, maybe group for later, or this place. Could, you, you're looking at all the different possibilities. What that's going to enable you to do is when, instead of going to AR 362 or 355 or Christmas Rock or your every where everybody else is, especially on the weekend, it's going to give you a place to go back to because that's going to be a good place because it holds fish. I mean, if there's bait there now, there could be bait there again. And this, that you also a captain's log is very important. So, like this, say it's July 1st. I was telling you, I seen that three jumping sailfish today. That's right there in my head, but that, I'll forget that. So I went home and I wrote it down. And I said, this is what I've seen today. And it may not be that I'm going to catch that sailfish in 30 foot of water, but that's telling me things are changing, they, you know, patterns are changing, so that you get to dial in on that, that kind of thing. Um, 
But I got, got a little off subject here while I'm holding these. I'm going to go ahead and, and tell you what I do with these. When you see all those bait fish scattering like that, something I like to do, and this is a very inexpensive way to do it, this is a, this is a boom squids. You can take your real small chin weight, start with your 150-pound leader, 130-pound leader, start right here, make you a loop in one end and crimp it with your crimp. Slide these in, nose first. Put your weight in the head of it, and then crimp you another crimp. And basically, you're going to create a daisy chain. Very inexpensive daisy chain. If you bought them, you know how expensive they are. But you can do that, put four or five of them. And at the very end, now this is it, this is just something to show you. I mean, it could be you can put an islander on the back of it. You can put anything you want on the back of it. You can use a different color. But if you put something a little bit bigger, something with a hook in it, uh, or ballyhoo, you know, with a lure in front of it, as you're pulling that, that is going to drive whatever's around crazy. And I have caught <coughs> everything from yellow fin tuna, black fin tuna, wahoo, king mackerel, um, you know. It's, it's kind of, I got my mate, uh, Clint, it's funny, he has a thing, I always say, well, look, I want at least one or two of these. I use a little different, I don't use squids, I use something with a weighted head, but it's the same principle and it works the same. And uh, you, you're, on, you're going to want a leader, depending on what you're fishing for, depending on the time of year you're fishing for, whether you want leader uh, made of mono or leader made of wire. And, uh, you know, you don't want to be trolling in the fall with that, with mono. Because a while he's going to take it and go away. I mean, he'll eat it. He's going to eat it, but you're going to lose it. And a lot of people, uh, a lot of us, I mean, I tend to pull a lot of wire unless it's all dolphin, and then I'll switch. Because, I mean, you don't want to lose that king. You don't want to lose that wahoo. Because I guarantee you, when you don't have it, that's when you're going to catch it. And it happened to us about four trips ago, and I had switched off because I hadn't seen a wahoo in three trips. Then I didn't put no wire out that trip, and we lost one. So. Lost a rig and everything. It was kind of expensive and it hurt our feelings because we lost a fish. But that's a good idea. Little things like that are going to put fish in the boat because you're thinking outside the box. And all you're doing is you're trying to mimic what is going on around you. You know, if you see these little flying fish, and sometimes you'll see them that they're real big flying fish. Then you'll see these little ones. And that's what it's going to kind of mimic. Maybe like this bigger one and the other ones. And then that fish, you're going to see this big one. Hmm. It's going to come up, and it gets their attention, too. Uh, speaking about getting attention before moving on to some other game, um, and this ain't necessarily a teaser. It's actually smaller. This is pretty good uh, selfish lure or any, any type of big game lure. But we use a 12 to 24-inch lure similar to this. It's made by Molecraft, and we pull it in between or at the very end of a squid chain, kind of like this, but the squids are 12 inches long. And we pull them on either side off the teaser reels on your T-top. And if you have a T-top, you can rig it up. All you need is like, if you got some old, I use old 4 rot reels that I used to use for bottom fishing for grouper. And most people have outriggers. If you don't have outriggers, there's still ways to, to get, them, get your stuff out there. You can use your downriggers, open your downriggers out, put them on your downriggers. I mean, you, you can put them out of, I've seen them on broomsticks, cut off broomsticks in your, because all the T-tops nowadays have like the kingfish rod holders. And so there's, and all that's going to do is that is going to give you a little bit more presentation, a little bit more attention. When you're out there in 200 feet of water, 300 feet of water, you want to create as much of a school of fish looking thing that you can possibly come up with. Whether you're pulling a dredge or teasers. And that will bring, and I have actually lost teasers from fish coming up and eating my teasers. So if you're asking me if teasers work, teasers work. Without a doubt. Uh, you will catch a lot of fish. You'll catch a lot of big, big gaffer dolphin. You'll catch a lot of billfish. A lot of billfish come up on your teasers, and you'll get the bite by either dropping back, pulling that away from them, and baiting and switching. Um, and you know, that's a little more getting into something else uh, that we can probably address that here in a little bit. But that fish eat them. We, and actually, one, the one we lost wasn't the billfish. It was a big, big dolphin. It come up, crashed the bait. We were concentrating on that bait. He come back, missed that bait, and grabbed a hold of the teaser before we can get it away from him. And he took off and snapped the line. And so, yeah, 100 bucks later. But that just shows you, he ate it. And had he not probably come up on that teaser, then he went to the flat line, come back to the teaser, and uh, 
we were doing a couple different things. We had people eating lunch. We were we weren't focused, and that's what happens. It happens that quick. But they do work, uh, and you could also all this information you can find online if you want to figure out how to make something like that. Um, it's you may say, well, that's a lot of work, or this is, you know, the thing is though, you spent a ton of money on a boat. I don't care. I know even that 24 foot boat is high dollar. Um, you spent money on all your baits, your poles, and all this. Go ahead and spend the extra time to figure out ways to get the fish to your boat instead of just pulling around aimlessly, hoping that a fish is going to bite your bait. You know, and that's that's part of. Uh, I mean, you could use spreader bars. You can use a whole lot of stuff. But anything that can draw attention to your boat is good. It's like if you're Spanish fishing. We talked about Spanish fishing that last seminar. Uh, using birds, different things to draw attention to you. I mean, it, it works. Um, covering the water column too is another thing. Uh, this is a uh, old salty planer. This is a number 16. You can, uh, I mean, they're smaller planers that are for the rods, and a lot of people like those. Uh, we don't use a whole lot of them. Uh, we like to use our uh, planers on our downriggers. We have 200 pound. Uh, braid on our downriggers, and we'll pull a number 24 or a number 32 on that and set it to a desired depth. And once it's set, we normally don't even worry about it after that. Okay? What we do is we'll use paper clips and rubber bands. You'll take your your line, whatever you're going to put down, set it back to your you know 30, 50 feet, however far you want it back. Take your line, put it on that. Take your paper clip, wrap it around that. And then let it go, and it'll run all the way. And then you can kind of judge however far you want it down. It'll go all the way down to the to the planer, or you can bring it up halfway, or however you guys want. You know, you can play with it. I wouldn't just leave it in one position, run it down to the planer, and forget about it, because they may not be biting at that depth. I mean, you got to pay attention. Okay, well I'm getting bites here. I'm not getting bites, so then adjust it throughout the day. Well, I mean, I'm going to raise start at 20 feet, and by the end of the day, you might have it on the planer, and that's where you're getting your bites at. But you're covering a whole column, so. You, you know, you're, you're not out there. I mean, people wonder why, you know, well, this guy's catching fish, this guy isn't catching fish. Those little details, the teasers, the planers, covering the whole column, um, you know, the daisy chains or, or whatever else you want to try, it draws attention to your spread. And uh, that's really what's going to start the fish to get the, their attention. Once they get their attention, they'll come in and eat, and then you're, you're catching your fish. A lot of times, too, People will, um, you know, you're trolling an offshore. Let's say you're trolling this lure right here, this fathom lure. And you're trying to catch sailfish. You're just kind of generic offshore trolling. You're trying to catch your dolphin. You're trying to catch whatever. And then come time, it's like right now, the dolphin are pushed in shore a little bit. And you're trying to fish shallow water and using the same techniques, same baits and things of that nature. And you're not getting as, as many bites. You're not catching fish. And the guy beside you, comes in at the dock and you've got three fish, he's got 40 fish. And you're like, well, what were you doing? You, know, you were trolling out there, I was doing the same thing. These are some baits right here when the dolphin move in shore that you you guys right now can really take advantage of. Uh, and it's very inexpensive, the trips aren't far, you can run 10, 15, 20 miles, catch plenty of dolphin. This is a blue water candy lure. It's a weighted jig head and a treble hook on wire so that way if your king bites it you're good if a dolphin bites it you're good and uh, if you want to take a look at that you can but they, they've got them right here at the store I personally have used these and they do work uh, matter of fact we caught some dolphin on them the other day is there any specific color you like yeah I do um, I like the blue and white just because the flying fish are blue and white it tends to work real well, well. Uh, this color right here looks kind of like a dolphin, and, uh, and we were going over dolphin being cannibalistic, and they do eat theirself a lot. I mean, they grow so fast. Um, so that right there would work. And uh, so chartreuse, blue and white, uh, uh, and you know, pay attention to what if you catch one and then he spits up something, or mm -hmm. see what they're eating, and then you try to you can try to match the hatch a little bit, change up colors, and throughout the day try different things, try different colors. And once you find out, they may be biting one color. It might be pink, pink and white. And it might be blue and white. And then so add another one to your spread. And you'd be surprised that maybe them two are getting busy, then add another one. And uh, there's been days there's only one bait that they'll bite. And that 
normally happens when you have that one bed only. And uh, then so you're sitting there catching them on that bed, and you reset and reset. Uh, so you just you know, be just be aware. Don't just okay. Well, we caught the fish. Well, where was he at in the spread? Was it the short rigger? Uh, was it the long rigger? Was it way back? Was it down? If it was down, how, how what was the depth of it? And because uh, that really is a big difference, and you see in the pattern for the day. If you can find the pattern, that's going to put you on fish. You'll probably hear bass fishermen talking about that a lot in the tournament trail. Bass fishermen, they'll say, "Well, that was the pattern for the day. I got dialed in on it, and that's why he won the tournament because he paid attention to it." Um, and, and that's a big thing. Pay attention to what their color to bite, where it was set in the spread, okay. things of that nature. And um, I guess moving on, I know uh, dolphins is something that everybody kind of can catch because it's inshore, uh, when I say inshore, inside of 20 miles. And that's uh, something that for anybody in bay boats, uh, skiffs on a nice day, can go get. And it's a good change. Um, you know, instead of just focusing on your inshore fish, uh, you know, the spraying, catch your bonita, you know, Spanish mackerel. Work your way out the Fall King mackerel bite on the beach. It's easy. You can do that with a, a skiff. I've got buddies that have 16 foot skiffs and they're catching 30 pound kings and 30 foot of water in the fall right on the beach. They got two poles with them, a dozen live bait, and that's it. And they're, they're going out there having a ball. When the cobia come in in the spring, they're doing the same thing. So you don't necessarily have to have a real big offshore boat to take advantage of uh, some of the best you know fishing of the year, really. How long does it take you to go out 20 miles? You know, like well, that? your boat, you figure, your boat can run uh, probably 35 knots, I'm guessing. Yes. Uh, so you could do the math, less than an hour, I mean, 30 minutes. Uh, I mean, it depends on how hard you want to run it, depends on the sea conditions. But it isn't a great deal of a run. And, and, uh, and a lot of times you may set your number at 20 miles, and then you come across something at 12 miles. And that's we're not getting blinded on, hey, that number. Because there's been many days you'll go to that number and there ain't nothing going on. And you're thinking, wow, well, I passed some bait back there. I saw some bait on top of the water and some birds on it, but I didn't stop because I was going to go to that number. So you just got to be aware of your surroundings. Uh, but uh, you can fish with that boat. Uh, you'll get real come. Matter of fact, I'd love to see you in about a year from now. And uh, it's going to be a different world for you. You're going to you're going to be very excited, man, because that, that boat will do a lot for you. You'll be really excited. Um, I have a question on that uh, saltwater candy rig. Uh -huh. Do you put um, like those cigar minnows on there? You know, I tell you, that's a very good question. Uh, cigar minnows is what is the common term that a lot of people use. Uh, I don't use cigar minnows a lot just because of the price. So, uh, Spanish sardines are just as good. Well, depending on where it comes from in the, in the company, but a lot of times you can get a nice Spanish sardine, and you could use ballyhoo on that, Spanish sardines, cigar minnows, any of that stuff. And it's very straightforward so the, with the weight. You're going to run the weight, if it's a dead bait, up through the bottom jaw, out through the nose, mm -hmm. and then put the treble in the back of the, of the bait. And that's going to be the same for uh, ballyhoo. Uh, if you're going to use the ballyhoo, you're going to make sure you break his beak. That way you don't have a whole bunch of beak because that's going to make it swim no, it swim sense. weird. Yeah, exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's a very good question. And only you different... it with a planer, right? Um, or either way? You can. Not not one this big. When, no. Yeah, when I was about this planer was primarily offshore. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, you can use a number one planer, you know. Uh, uh, a lightweight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something a little bit more light. You can tie it directly to your rig. Just make sure your leader's long enough. I mean, if you're uh, king mackerel fishing, you're going to want a, a little bit longer of a leader. They grow slow. They got big eyes. And uh, now some days they'll eat and eat a real short leader. But a lot of days they won't. And uh, so, I mean, the leader between your planer and this rig is what I was talking about. So, do you actually hook up the planer to the downrig instead of the ball? Well, that's the ball is good for slow trolling live bait. Okay. Okay. If you're if you're high speed trolling dead, not high speed trolling, but if you're trolling at four knots, you'll have so much blowback on the ball that and it, and it, and it creates a really big disturbance. It's not ideal. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the ball is what you're going to want to use on live bait, menhaden or bluefish or mullet or whatever else you're going to use. But that's a good question. A lot of people mm -hmm. troll with a weight at four knots and. Um, it, it, you know, you got a lot of blowback, so your baiting as far down as it could be. 
Um, so yeah, that uh, that's 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 a good question. You just like a quick release on the uh, liner. Or yeah, well, I mean, if you're going to try to uh, troll it directly to, on your rod, your live bait rod, mm -hmm. uh, you can just use the planer, tie it directly to your rod, okay. and then run you a leader from that to this, like a mono leader, like a shock leader. Okay. And that could be anywhere from 20 feet, 15 feet, to 30 feet. I mean, it could be longer than that. depends on, you know, the day. depends on the water clarity. If the water's real clear, just think about it. You want to scale down all your terminal tackle. You want to maybe extend your leaders longer. Uh, go to fluorocarbon. There's a lot of things you can do to increase bites on, on real clear days and clear water. Any more questions on the downriggers or how to use them or uh, planers versus downrigger balls? Does the sound that the downrigger is making occasionally, does that transfer down and affect um, your bike? Of the yeah. wire? Yeah. You know, it does. Uh, some people, they have, there's mixed emotions. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Uh, a lot of people have a feeling that it runs fish off. Um, I personally go to mono mm -hmm. or uh, braid on my downriggers. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I'm tournament king mackerel fish, I use mono. Sure. And a couple reasons for that. If you have a fish on, a lot of times <clears> the king, he'll come up and <throat> eat that bait and then run right past the boat. Mm -hmm. And if you have wire on your downrigger, you're losing the fish. If you're fishing with 20 pound test and it hits that 150 pound mono, it's going to slice right through it like cheese, a cheese break. So you lose a ball. Yeah. But you might get yeah, that exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So yeah, but that's a very good question. And I I don't use uh, wire anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, with the if you're gonna, I mean even a number 32 planer with 200 pound braid sure. works great. Yeah. An, and it reduces the hum to nothing. Yeah. And it, and the braid is also very good. It's very thin in diameter. Sure. So it cuts through the water, so you don't have as much blow by, like that young man was talking about. You know. So uh, that's, a, that's a good product to use. And so unless you're really doing some type of tournament king back fishing, braids a good way to go when you're down right yeah. This is a, talk about inexpensive well, hey. Yeah, push that over here. Sure, See us, we, we just, we're just. <laughs> so we're in the hot seat and we get no fan, but I, well, I, I still love you, Chris. It's all right. <laughs> But, uh, that's why I bring two waters. All the talking and the heat. <laughs> Different lures, you know, that you could also use, and this is a this is kind of a funny funny deal here. This little Lower here, I think it's six, eight bucks. Very simple, but it's got a lot of action. It had about six, seven knots. It's going to pop, pop, and it, and it really makes that ballyhoo really dance a lot. I caught 600 pound bluefin gin on that little lure in front of a horse ballyhoo. Not necessarily this color, but uh, I didn't have the money when I first started fishing, so I just used what I had. It's amazing what they'll do. Elephants eat peanuts. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind. But, uh, so you don't have to get the most expensive thing. Um, moving into, uh, does anybody wahoo fish or have y'all wahoo fish in the past? Okay, good. That, that's, to, yeah. yeah. Um, well, the wahoo fish is actually straightforward. Um, some of the things you can do in the fall to really help you catch fish is pay attention to the water temps, temp breaks. Uh, I was mentioning earlier, I don't know if you were here uh, talking about different uh, things that you can purchase to help you with that, like frying pan tower, Dave Tilly's got that fish here map. Is it's a right? very... Oh, I'm sorry, is a fish here map like a one-time thing? It's a one-time $25 uh, per trip. It sounds okay, I know probably what you think, wow, $25 on top of the... But if you look at it like this, if that saves you running... $25 in boat fuel ain't far. Yeah. So, you know, if you're going to go 50 miles to go gear up, you got your 50s or your TLD, 30, 25, whatever you use. I use 10 international stuff. But uh, whatever you use, you can spend a lot of money on all that. 
So spend the $25 to be more, at least you can get two or three spots until you know kind of what you're looking for. I mean, if you see a real hard break over a good area, a little funnel that's right at the edge of the break, and it's been there for two or three days, there's going to be fish on it. If it's been there for a day, not necessarily, but pay attention to it. It's kind of hard sometimes because you'll get cloud cover and the, some of the free services, Rutgers, and there's a lot of them. Uh, you can't really get a good dial in on what you need to fish. But uh, Wahoo is very, uh, they will stack up in the fall. And I mean, we've had 22 fish days to where, and you're fishing an eddy that comes in, you may not even be all the way in the stream. But that eddy spins off and it's been there and it looks good for a while. You get there, there's no other boat there. You're working at Eddie, and every time you make a pass, and it's normally in like one direction. They're either biting with the current, against the current, or whatever they like that particular day. And every time you make a pass, boom, you're picking up a fish. And that's another thing. Remember we talked about the color. Pay attention to where that bait was in the spread, what he bit, where he bit. And if you can just, hey, if you're catching a 30-pound fish or 20-pound fish every time you troll by there, it don't take long to fill your box. I don't know how big your, your cooler is in your, in your boat, but... Uh, I know that 22 fish day, I was scooping ice out, fit, taking out life jackets, and I've got a, uh, a contender that's got a very large fish box. That thing was slammed full. Because you know how them 30, 40, 50, 60 oh, yeah. pound wahoos, I mean, they're, you know, long as me. Uh, but wahoo is a, is a fish that um, a lot of times they don't get the respect they deserve. Sometimes they get too much respect. Um, they're a very aggressive <laughs> eater. They like fast baits, certain colors. Uh, it, you don't have to have long leaders. They're normally pretty aggressive when they do eat. You don't have to have a big, crazy long leader. Four foot leader, number 10 wire, number nine wire. I use number 10. It's just a little more rigid. You can use it more without replacing it. The nine is gonna to wanna to kink up on you a little bit. Uh, but uh, you definitely, whenever you're doing wahoo fishing, this is gonna be one of your best friends right here either a number 16 to a number 24 or number 32 planer. There's been days to where I've got all my bikes on the planer, and there's been days I haven't, that I haven't even got a bike. But you always want to have at least one of these down. During Wahoo season, we'll have two. We'll put, put one on, say, 116 or 124, and then 132 on the other side. So you're covering two different depths of the water. And you can also adjust your planer to where it either dives deeper or lighter, where you can fish different parts. So if you're marking fish or you're getting the bites in one particular, you can kind of zone in on that area and catch more fish. Um, this actually would be a really good Wahoo lure, red and black. Uh, they like shiny stuff too. Um, literally you can, anything that's got uh, some mylar in it. Blue and white is always like probably one of my favorites for any type of game fish. I've caught blue marlin on it, Wahoo, tunas, you name it, dolphin, blue and white islander or whatever. Uh, but blue and white, and if it's got the blue and white with the, the mylar in it, it's a very hot color. The red and black with a piece of mylar in it. Orange and black with mylar in it. Uh, pink and white, you know. And it don't have to have mylar, but it does seem like it picks up more strikes with the mylar in it. Or anything that, that kind of retracts light or reflects light. And uh, I, Wahoo, you need a big hook. Um, a lot of people go under size hooks. They're using the same hooks that they use on their dolphin and stuff, eight, nine knot hook. I would start at about a 10 knot hook. I, I kind of go with about a 10 knot or so, maybe. It depends on the size of fish we're trying to target. But uh, Wahoo, they do a lot of head shaking. I mean, you know when you get a Wahoo one, first he's burning down, you don't see the fish, and you feel that on your rod. You know you got a Wahoo. And so he's constantly trying to shake that hook loose. So if you don't have enough hook in that mouth, you're going to lose that fish. And that's where you hear a lot of people pulling hooks with water. Is using a, a, a hook that's just a little bit small. Uh, Mustad has got a really good hook. Uh, 7691 stainless steel hook. Um, it lasts forever. A lot of people are against it because it don't rust out if the fish gets it in his mouth. I haven't lost a lot of hooks into a fish's mouth. So I can't say that, that that's a problem. Uh, but you can reuse it over and over and over and over and over again. And uh, you could get you, most of y'all probably have a bait bucket. I have a brand specific or uh, uh, whatever we're fishing for. I've got a Wahoo bucket. I drill holes in a five-gallon bucket and then put my hooks and my lures dangling from a bucket. So if I'm going Wahoo fishing that day, 
I bring it in, drill holes in the bottom, when you get back, spray it off, you're good to go. Have your, your mahi bucket, or whatever the case is. But uh, that, that is one reason a lot of people miss water, is the hook size. That's a big reason, and not enough, not enough drag on the, on the fish. Uh, they're going to burn offline. Don't be afraid of it. You're not going to get spooled. Uh, even on a TLD or something of that nature, or a pin six odd even. Uh, uh, very seldom have I ever seen that happen. Unless you get demand on there, they can happen. Anything can happen. Uh, but make sure you have enough drag. That way, when that hook he gets that bait and he makes that run, it's going to get that side of that mouth, and that hook's big enough. So when he does his thing, you're not going to lose that fish. That's a that's a good, oh, I hate to interrupt you. That's a great point to make though. That you go out and spend tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on boat and equipment, and you go out there with tackle getting ready to catch a fish and don't know how to set your drag, don't know how to fight the fish at what particular drag. So um, if you don't have a drag scale, I would get one and test it. You know, set your drag. See what you're pulling on it where you've got it at strike. See what you're pulling on it when you've got it at, you know, in, in full gear. And um, make, sure, make sure it's right. That is a very good point. Um, you can, and it's, most of y'all have a, Something weighs fish that goes up to 50 pounds. And that's plenty enough to set anything, you know, 50s, 70s even. Uh, you're not going to go, I mean, really, I mean, even if, when you're fighting bluefin too, and a lot of times you'll hear people, oh, I went up to 70 pounds of drag. Now, if you're fighting one in Nova Scotia or, or mm -hmm. Prince Edward, yeah, you might need that if you got a 1,000 pound fish and you're fighting with 130 and you're sitting in a chair. 25 pounds of drag is a lot of drag. That's a lot of drag. And you need to kind of understand where your drag is on your individual rod. Uh, some rods max out at, say, 22 pounds or 20 pounds or 35 pounds. So each, that's why you'll notice on each rod, like I use Penn International stuff on my offshore gear, and there's marks on there. And each mark I'll know, like it strike, I want, say, 20 pounds of drag or 15 pounds of drag or whatever I want for that species. So you know where you're at at that amount. And that being said, once that fish is in there, you've got him in hook, and he's hooked good, and you need a little bit more drag. You shouldn't be afraid to, because you don't know where that drag is in. And we've all done it before. We've had fish on, and you're going, God, do I? I don't want to put too much. We well, if you knew, then you wouldn't be afraid of it, because you know that I've got a 50-pound line or 80-pound line or whatever pound line that you have, and you know what that is capable of. So then you can push it up a little bit more. And then that way you can get the fish to the boat quicker, especially if you're catching releasing. Then that way you know that that fish is released pretty much unharmed. So that's uh, that's a very good point with your drags. So use your fish scale. And uh, what you'll do is you can put it in a fight belt or you can just hold it. Take that, kneel down at a 45 until that starts pulling off. And that, look at your weight and that will tell you. And then you can do drag settings accordingly. And then don't be afraid to mark it on the reel if, they, if you don't have marks or get an idea or you can make a, na a notch in it or however. That way you're comfortable setting your drags. Drag's your friend. It does the work. You know, this right here don't last. A full day of offshore fish, if you're in a fish, it don't work. I get charters every day. And the best people that fight fish are the young ladies. I'm telling you, they will fight it because they listen and they don't try to, you know, they use their technique and it works. And they let, and when they're fighting the fish and the fish is running, I very seldom have them trying to, I just say, look, let it run. Let the drag do it. And they'll sit there, yeah, and they'll sit there and let the fish run. Let the drag do its work. And then as that fish, when he stops, that's when it's your job to get. And uh, so, yeah, um, that, that, that's, that's pretty funny. Real fun, but it does. That is something that you you need to kind of get uh, acquainted with how much pressure to put on each fish. Wahoo, uh, I've caught wahoo at 12 knots. I've caught them at uh, sitting still, live baiting. Um, it really depends. I don't do high speed trolling specifically for wahoo because that's what you do. I know people do it in the Bahamas. People do it, but I do do it moving from spot to spot. If I'm, it helps you cover ground. You know there and. Don't be afraid to use a real large, heavy, uh, you, know, you could use cowbells, you could use, there's a, a array of different baits 
or lures that you can pull for a wahoo. You don't have to have meat behind it. Uh, I pull a combination. I pull lures, strictly lures, then I'll pull uh, a few baits, horse ballyhoo, behind islanders or behind different lures too. Some days they'll key in on one or the other. But I, I mix it up a little bit. If I move them from spot to spot, let's say that you want to move two miles, three, four miles down the road, and uh, you don't want to pick up all your gear, so reset your outriggers, all that stuff, your planers and all that. Switch your stuff out, put those uh, lures, and just patrol four. You can run at 12 knots, you can cover a lot of ground. And uh, you'd be surprised what, I've caught dolphin, you know, sitting there running like that, trying to cover ground, catching, catching dolphin, catch wahoo. And uh, so you're just, you're being efficient. Instead of picking up, there's, there could be a lot of fish between your spot and that next spot. But trolling, uh, in universal trolling speeds, like six knots, you know, four and a half to six knots, seven knots. Depends on what, what your boat does. Each boat's different too. My boat weight may be different at five knots or six knots than your boat or your boat. So however your boat acts, however that weight looks, you want it clean as possible. Um, try lifting your trim tabs up. Try putting them down. See which way looks better. And that's what you're going to want to do. Each vessel is so different. I mean, just because it works on mine don't mean it's going to work on yours. Um, but uh, that is something when you're trolling for Wahoo, try to have a mix of colors. A mix because they 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 do dial in on stuff. I have, you know, they're not very hard to catch, but I have seen them where they're like they want something, that one particular thing. Because they're eating, let's say they're eating albacore, or they're eating a, a, a small tuna that's out there. So they they're more key to like a purple and a, something dark. And then other days they're eating on flying fish or something like that, big flying fish, and then you might want to blue and white. So try a lot of stuff, and then gradually change your spread to match what they're wanting for that day. But it uh, it does work. What uh, what are some of the problems that you had when you were wahoo fishing? Anything that comes to your mind? Mm. Nothing really. Um, most were just getting off the line, now fighting through mono and all that extra. Yeah, mono. That, uh, yeah. You know, there's a lot of captains, and uh, like I said, I, I do a lot of wire trolling. Matter of fact, until about this time of year, I'm all wire. I mean, I'm strictly wire. People say, yeah, well, you're going to miss out on this fish, or you're going to miss out on that fish. You need a 60-pound fluorocarbon to catch elephant tan. Most of y'all who know me, I catch tunas. I catch tunas when other people aren't catching tunas. I've caught tunas on wire. I've caught blue marlin on number 10 wire. So don't be afraid to pull it. And when you do get a strike from a king, because there's kings in the Gulf Stream, there's kings, you know, there's, there's mm -hmm. wahoo in shore. Um, so don't be afraid of it. Um, you know, that, that is something you, I wouldn't be afraid of. And that will stop that and you will put more fish in the boat. And that wire, the number 10 wire, in, it, it specifically is pretty tough. You can fish with it more than one fish, unless it's a unique thing, and he swallows the hook, and you know, you're gaffing him, and he wraps up, and, he, and you, you can't sit or something. But for the most part, you can fish over and over again with that wire. And uh, try that next time. Go out there and rig up the wire. Especially in the fall, I don't even pull nothing but wire. Uh, and Early part of the year, mid May to mid June, I'm trolling all wire, almost all wire. So yeah, that ain't something to be concerned with. Um, any questions on uh, any wahoo or anything of that nature? Are you still using the uh, teasers whenever you're, you know, talking about your wahoo leader? Oh, you, you mean wire on my? Well, when you're using wire. Oh, when I'm wahoo fishing, yeah. do I use teasers? Right. Uh, you know, I tell you, I do. Uh, mm -hmm. I, maybe it's maybe it makes a difference, maybe it doesn't. Uh, but I, I tend to feel that it does. It just draws more attention to my spread. Uh, when you got six, eight, twelve-inch squid back there, and you got a sixteen-inch mole craft lure dancing behind it. Yeah. And it looks, you know, it's got the big eyes on it, the big concave face, and it's throwing that big smoke trail. Mm -hmm. if you, to the wahoo, I yeah. mean, hey, they got it. Well, you know, they're aggressive, mm -hmm. and I've had them come up and take a chunk out of my, my uh, teaser, yeah. uh, which I'd rather have than something that can just take it away like a sure. billfish or, sure. you know, so, I mean, you can always replace it. So, yeah, I do think it makes a difference. And a lot of times we'll pull a flat line, matter of fact, all the time, 
like let's say your teaser's out of your T top, or if you're if it's on your downrigger and you're pulling it, have a bait set right behind it. Mm -hmm. They may come up on that teaser and then say five feet behind it, come back and plow that bait. Okay. It happens a lot. So they come up on that teaser, and I guarantee you, if that teaser weren't there, you may or may not have had it, but probably not. Sure. Because that drew, that drew them up, and then it may be something weren't quite right to them, but then he saw that horse valley hoo back there, or that valley hoo, or that little bit of valley who they had to have it. Mm -hmm. Happens a lot. Is the distance um, that you need to let the lures and the teasers be out behind the boat, is, it, is there a certain suggestion for certain types of fish, or... Yeah. Just automatically so many feet out. Well, no, that's a good question. Because certain fish have a different tendency of eating and a different way of eating. Um, the teasers typically are going to go in the same position. But we're, and that would be right as your boat wake levels out and flattens out. You don't want it way back in your spread because then you got to clear it. And you don't want something coming up and eating it. You can't get it back to the boat quick Too enough. Far. You want to bring your boat into the spread. Okay, and what I mean by that, don't treat your boat as a sterile piece of, you know, like billfish. They'll come up, and I've had them come up right to my motors. Swim, I mean, just right up into the spread. They're aggressive. So, you know, the more you can incorporate everything and make it look like a bait school of bait fish, the better. Uh, but normally, if you can run your teasers just where the water gets clean, right behind that first wave, and each boat's different. I don't know because every hole is so different. Yeah. So I mean, I can't. There's not a. But you'll know when it looks. Right behind the weight zone. Yeah, you don't want it. Yeah, you don't want it too close to the boat, and you want it just far enough back where you can set your flat lines to where. Because sailfish are very, very keyed in on teasers. Billfish are keyed in on teasers. Almost all species will come in on a teaser from time to time, but especially billfish. And uh, when they do come in on your teasers, that's something that you could uh, research, but each fish acts different. A uh, blue marlin, if you drop it back to him, a lot of times he may or may not take it. You're ripping that teaser back to him, then you put that, that bait right in front of him, a lot of times he'll eat it. A sailfish, you can drop it back to him, and he'll turn around and go back and get it. A white marlin, you better put it right in his mouth. So each fish is different in the way you handle it coming up to that teaser. Some of them you want to rip that teaser away as fast as you can. Um, Slowly, I mean, there's, you know, it's just part of experience when you when you do it. But that's a very good question. Certain fish like a certain position to spread a lot of times. Uh, tunas a lot of times tend to like it way back. Uh, blue marlin sometimes right in the prop wash. Sometimes on your short rig on either side. Uh, and uh, big baits, big disturbance with kind of in that vicinity of that teaser. So if that teaser gets his his attention. And then he sees that big thing acting up and going crazy, and it's got that big horse belly heel on it, or whatever, or Spanish mackerel, or whatever you got rigged on it. He will eat it. And uh, so, uh, and you know, wahoo. I've had them eat in all positions of the boat. Same with dolphin. Uh, but that's something each day too. It will be a somewhat different. Uh, blue marlin is very kind of specific on the what they like, and uh, they're not afraid to come up and get personal with you. I've had them hit every dang thing in the spread and not hooked up. Drop stuff back to him. I don't know if he weren't hungry or he was just ill, but he's the man of the sea there, you know. So he's the, he's the APEC guy. I mean, so whatever, he, he's there to just create havoc in my spread, and I'm there to try to prove that I'm better than he is, at least for that minute before I release him. So, uh, but that's a very good, very, very good question. Is there any uh, fish specific that's in the beginning that's like a spooky about the boat, like not get you know, tuna can be, um, you know, sometimes king mackerel, depending on the conditions, if it's real flat um, and, you know, it's real clear, mm -hmm. uh, you may want to, you know, I always have one shotgun or one way back um, and because you don't never know. That's that's part of covering your whole base. If you got one way back there, then you know that there's one way back there. So if there's a fish that can eat, they may be particularly uh, keen with their eyesight uh, or leader shy, and this far back, like a tuna, sometimes a king. Now, sometimes a king will eat right in the prop wash. Some of my biggest kings I've had eat right there in the prop wash. But there's days when it's dead calm and the bite's slow because the water's super clear that you may want to put something back a lot further. 
and uh, to a, a good to the Lord, like a green machine or a plug, cedar plug. Because mm -hmm. when you got it way back there, I mean, you got it way back there. I mean, you got almost a whole. Sometimes you're looking at that spool, going, man, I hope something don't jump on that real big. Because if it does, I may lose. I may lose this one. But uh, but you don't have to worry about keep checking your your value behind your lure. And that's where like a plug or a green machine or something like that would be really good for that kind of tuna situation. Way back. Also, a very, very good question. Any questions on uh, any about the spread or what? Can you say one more time how you connected your line from your reel to that planter on your downriver? What you said with the paper clip and now you okay, okay yeah. When you you're talking about from your when your downrigger yeah well, okay that's it. set your downrigger set this at whatever position you want it right. okay let's say you want it at 100 feet because if you got it out at 100 feet it's probably only going to be at about 40 40 feet give mm -hmm. or take maybe 50 depends on the size line that you have on your uh, if you got 200 pound braid that's about what you're going to get maybe right. get best so let's say you set it out at 50 feet once it's down there you're going to take your lure or whatever you have. Set it back however far you want in your spread. So let's say you want it back 30 feet, 50 feet, 60 feet, whatever you want. Take it, and once you get it set, you're going to take it, pull it down, get your rubber band and your paper clip. And take your paper clip, put it on the main line, and then wrap it in that um, rubber band. Once it's there, all you got to do is put that in, uh, make sure your clicker's on, drop it in the free spool. And then let it climb, it'll climb right down that line. And it'll go down. So you can start it, say, count till you get down until you think it's 20 feet, 30 feet, mm -hmm. or whatever, or run it all the way down. That way you'll know maybe run it all the way down to the planer that first right. time. And you feel it hit the planer. So you know right there it's at that depth. And then see if you're getting bites. And if not, try adjusting it. Pull it up. Bring it up 10 feet. Bring it up, you know, say 10 cranks, 20 cranks. Right. See what that works. But it's very straightforward. You just attach that paper clip to your line and then the rubber blend to the uh, or to the uh, downrigger line and then the other to your line and it'll climb right down your line. Yeah. Yeah. Real, so real. Put a paper clip on the downrigger line too, right? Yeah, and yeah. And then wrap well, wrap yeah on the downrigger line and then your rubber band is gonna be on your main, yeah. yeah. And then you put that hook that on yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it'll run right down. And, and don't worry about trying to clear it, you know, for the most part. Now, if you get three fish on, you're yeah. probably going to want to do it. But, like, if you, if you get a wahoo bite and he bites it, fight that fish, do its thing, get him down, bring him to the other side of the boat. I mean, you could do that by turning into the fish, right. and then that way you don't have to pull the planer. And that way you don't have to worry about it. That's part of the ease of it. And then all you need, and, and rubber bands and paper clips are so cheap. And you can use a the plastic ones, mm -hmm. and it uh, works real well. And it's very, very, very cheap. So you're not actually hooking your line to the planer? <coughs> What's that? So you're not actually hooking your line to the planer? No, the, the planer is just the apparatus. Uh, imagine it like this. You've done King Mac because you asked yeah. me about the ball. On your ball, do you have a release clip ahead of it, above it? Or uh, you, do you run it out? It's back? actually on the uh, ball. The ball itself. Mm -hmm. um, Try this. This may work better for you too. A lot of people do that. They attach it with that little clip that they get and runs off the ball itself. But every time you need to get your ball up, you've got to take your ball out of the water. Okay? And that ball is swinging around, you know, and hit banging into your boat. Cannonball. Yeah. Take the ball, leave it in the water, take you a piece of uh, mono, 150 pound mono, mm -hmm. make you a loop, crimp it on one end, get you a downrigger release clip or an outrigger release clip. Run that down there, crimp that side, and then run another piece down here, and then put a, a snap swivel on this end. So all you have to do is, you know, your downrigger ball has got a little hole mm -hmm. on the top. Yeah. All you got to do is clip that. So then basically, when you, your, your downriggers, your ball's in the water, and your clip's right here. So your ball is not swinging back and forth, and all you have to do is reach in there and clip it. But your question is the... The planer is that same scenario. We're using that as a, it's not going to be attached to your line, so you don't have to fight that planer. So when that fish strikes, he's going to break that rubber band, and that line is going to burn off. And that planer is still down in the water, just like that ball would is when you get a fish on it. Yeah. Yeah. So is that, is that all it is? Is the paper clip goes on the, the 
the line going to the planer. Yeah. You snap it on, so now it's it's riding on. And the rubber band just goes through the other end and wraps around. It wraps around your line. Line and hook at it. Yeah, so when the line, when you get a fish on it, it just snaps yeah. that rubber band and rubs off. And so then you can do that. So then do you, do you bring that up? When you have the fish on? I, I do. You try to leave it down? I leave it down. I mean, there's no sense. So, first of all, when you're trying to pull the number 16, 24, 32 planer, it's pretty tough. Yeah, it's not easy. But now, if you have three or four fish on, or if you get a bill fish on, mm -hmm. you're going to need to bring it up. Yeah. Because at that point, you're probably going to be going to the fish, losing line, and you're going to be going crazy. But if you just get a wahoo bite on that planer, or you get a, a bite off the up top, or even sometimes two, it may not be that bad. But when you go more than one, then you might be bringing one fish to the boat and gaffing them on this side, gaffing another one on this side. And so if you are, then you know you don't want to run it through your downrigger line and cutting off no. and breaking off. So then you could have two or three paper clips on there. Yeah, I mean, that's, well, that, and that's what's going to happen at the end of the day. You're going to have a bunch of, a bunch of paper clips. Well, that's what you hope, because you hope that you got bit lines. You're going to draw it out? Uh, I'm probably not a real good drawer. Are you a good drawer? Uh, yeah. <laughs> They'll probably be helpful. Yeah. I, I, I failed art, no I didn't, but uh, I, I'm not real good at that. A lot better at telling you than I am uh, showing you. You just wrap it once around your, your line, your rubber band. Well, I'll do it more than that. You need a, a, couple, yeah, times. a couple different times. It'll still run down. Yeah, it'll still run down. You don't want it so tight that it won't run down, but you, you don't want it, you know, you just want it to, excuse me, attach good enough. So you don't want it to be yeah, stretching either. Yeah, slipping or whatever. So, yeah. So that would kind of, you know, that would kind of be the connection for where your line meets the... Man, you're pretty good. So that, that would be the, uh, this would be the line going to the planer and say this is your paper clip or this would be your paper clip I've always used a double barrel swivel um, with clamps on it and then run your rubber band here the rubber band loops around this so this would be your this would be your main line this would be your bait line and then this would be your planer line so it never connects this you know this is free to move all the way up and down the planer line so this, this so you be, can adjust your, your depth that's your planer there uh, it's actually going backwards. It would look like that, but that that connection there would be this. It would just be reversed. Yeah, you and you could use the two-way swivels. The only problem is, is you need to have quite a few because they're going to be down at the end of your planer, at the end, and they're kind of expensive. Yeah. And when you're running trips now for the individual, that maybe not matter. But uh, when you're running trips every day, and it, it can get really, really expensive. How are you adjusting the depth on that? By reeling up the rod, or the oh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. So you can drop it all the way down, reel it up a few feet, um, and every now and then it'll break loose. It might pop loose, and you how much do you have strung out behind that? Thing? Thirty feet, forty feet, fifty okay. feet, sixty feet, uh, whatever you think, uh, whatever looks good to you, uh, whatever you fish for, the conditions. A lot of things make a difference, but uh, you, know, you want it far enough back behind that planer that you know if a fish is planer shy, it's not affecting it. Just keep that in mind. So, you know, I would start minimum 30 feet, 60 feet is probably good, uh, and, or even further, 100 feet, you know, just depends on what you're trying to fish for. But it definitely works, and you don't have to mess with it a lot, and uh, it don't take a lot to play with it to get it right. It's very, once you do it, it's kind of hard to think about in your head, uh, even looking at a diagram is going to be kind of hard. Uh, but if you, you can get home, you can put your planer, tie off your downrigger, and then put your rod up there and then simulate it. It's very, very, very straightforward. Once you see it done, it's it's really, really straightforward. Works though. Works good. Um, I don't know uh, if uh, you guys have any other specific questions for any particular type of big game uh, prior to letting them let somebody else take over and uh, enlighten you with some of their knowledge. Anybody have any questions at all? Well, good deal. It's a pleasure uh, talking to everybody, and I hope you picked up uh, a little something out of it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mark. You. Thank you. One more day.